All right, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm very happy to be back at SDSCon. It's actually been a while for me. Uh, and uh, today I'm going to talk about something which is not uh, 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 very statistical, certainly more on the data science part of things. And uh, I want to talk about uh, transformers. So this is, uh, I would like first to acknowledge my uh, collaborators uh, who were all at MIT when we were working on this, Borean and Cyril were postdocs, and Yuri obviously still here. Uh, I'm going to keep this talk uh, not very technical, so if you want to read about the technical details, we have a survey style uh, preprint out uh, since December called the Mathematical Perspective on Transformers. And uh, I will also mention uh, in passing some, so this is a very active area of research for my group right now, and so we've been, uh, uh, we've been having some additional results. So before I start, I wanted to say the last SDS con I've attended was actually in 2020, and as you know, there was no SDS con in 2020. I just wanted to show, you know I'm really into t-shirt design, and, uh, and I did design a t-shirt, or I got someone to design a t-shirt, I guess in this case, for SDS con 2020, and that's what it looked like, so I figured I might as well just show it to people so it was not lost forever. And, uh, but yeah, so, you know, last uh, edition of SDS con, I was actually on sabbatical, so I did not attend, so for me, it's been a, a really long time, and I'm glad to actually be back with the stats and data science community at MIT. So today I'm going to talk about transformers, and uh, uh, since you know this is MIT, maybe you're expecting some robots involved in this uh, in this talk, right? Or maybe since I'm also affiliated with LIDs, you might expect some slightly less sexy applications uh, of uh, transformers. But uh, this is a, a MIT Stats and Data Science uh, day, so uh, I'm going to talk about this kind of transformers, the deep neural network uh, transformers. And in fact, since I also have an application to math, what, this is what transformers will be for me. And we will parse out this, uh, this uh, uh, formula, and we will see transformers are, as interacting particle systems, in fact. So before I get there, I, um, I wanted to uh, uh, spend a bit of time telling you about why we should care about transformers, what, how they're different from other uh, neural networks, and uh, the way I'm going to start it is with this uh, very incomplete historical perspective on uh, transformers uh, or neural networks in general. Okay, so arguably trans uh, neural networks where you know they existed, and we see a lot of people you know that survived the uh, nuclear winter of artificial intelligence, but really it uh, ended with this uh, uh, you know Hinton's group uh, work called uh, that introduced an architecture called AlexNet that you know blew out of the water everything in this ImageNet competition. And so in 2012, this is when it started, right? So it was, it was really starting to get hard to not talk about neural networks and machine learning. And over the years, they've been completely taking over machine learning. And uh, I'm going to highlight a couple. So there's like, you know, of course, a billion papers on this, on this line. But I'm going to first stop at 2023, because obviously I would have uh, a list of 16 architectures uh, for the one in 2024. And, uh, uh, but one that's going to be important for me is ResNets, which uh, are residual networks, which were introduced by our new colleague, uh, Kai Ming-He, in ECS. And, uh, and then you see that, you know, in 2017, in fact, their transformer architecture was introduced. And starting from there, there were new, uh, uh, well, new acronyms that started showing up, but maybe the ones that you uh, uh, are familiar with are ChatGPT and, you know, GPT-4 and uh, Claude and all these things that we hear about. And really, one of the shifts that really happened there is that we moved from vision to uh, vision applications like classification, uh, 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 image classification, or or edge detection, something like this, uh, to more natural language processing. And that's really when it started to become very pervasive to all of our lives. And this transformer architecture is really what made this thing possible. So what we're going to try to do is to really extract what it is about transformers that's different from what we've been doing before, and then try to understand how we can actually analyze this particular aspect of it. Um, uh, just for context, in fact, we'll see in a second, the transformers were also, also had a transformative impact on, on images. But really, it's in natural uh, language processing that these things uh, had the most impact. They really went from you know, very not scalable models to uh, highly scalable models and all the things that we see every day. And again, this thing was looped back into uh, uh, computer vision. So even the traditional things that were like AlexNets before now have some you know, elements of transformers in it. And this element that I keep on referring to is called attention, sorry. So attention is this thing right here. So there was this paper by, the, um, by a group, uh, 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 first author was Vaswani at Google in 2017 that introduced something called attention. 
And this, uh, this uh, attention thing had a really massive impact on, on everything we've done. So that's really this module that you put into transformer architectures that really changed, uh, changed the, the deal. And it had, so it had a, a, a several impact. One of them is actually on paper titles. Right, so as you can see, so this is just 2024. It seems that is all you need seems to be something. And if you if you want to use this, but you don't actually have something that's really a sufficient condition for things to work, don't worry. You can actually use is not all you need, <laughs> or you can also use is all you need. And uh, so there's various modifications you can apply so that this thing actually still uh, is valid for you. So please feel free to put that at the end of your uh, titles. All right. So in this talk, since I want to understand what a transformer is doing. I'm going to take a slightly different perspective than maybe the one you've been seeing when you see theoretical talks on, on, on neural networks. And I'm not going to try to understand how to train a neural network. I'm going to assume that someone in a, I guess, non-academic lab has trained a transformer for me, has handing it to me, and I want to know how it's processing data, right? So if I take, you know, I go on ChatGPT, it's already trained, I write the sentence, and it's fed through this, and something happens in the background, I want to understand what is happening there. Okay, how does it process data? So if you think about given a function, essentially, it's gonna be a function, we'll see what kind of function it is, but how it's processing data for us. So I'm going to start with the sort of more classical architecture called ResNets, right? Remember this was 2015 in our historical perspective. And uh, as I said, the usual application for this was image. And so here really the perspective you wanna keep in mind, at least at the, at the higher level, is that what neural networks are doing for us is that they are first learning an interesting representation, all right? So what is the representation of this image? It's, for example, a large vector of pixel intensities, okay? And, uh, and then when I go from this image, I would like to turn it into another vector which is much more amenable to, say, image classification. And so that's what the neural network is doing, is doing all these like computations in there. So it goes from X0 to XL, and the XL is my learned representation. And then on top of it, I apply a very classical machine learning step. For example, uh, here I use a, a logistic regression. For example, if I want to do binary classification, you could do multinomial regression. But really, the top of, of neural networks, the last layer is usually a very classical machine learning thing. And if you were in you know, pre 2012, typically people would put XL to be directly the input image and, and, uh, and uh, uh, just put it in this, uh, in this thing. So, you know, there was also some manual engineering of features where you would, you know, not look at vanilla pixels, but maybe some, you know, Fourier type uh, coefficients in there and then put them in this uh, classical machine learning step. So the classical machine learning step arguably is very well understood and I'm going to focus on really this part that goes from the input image to the learned representation. And the way this thing operates is by processing through what's called layers. We have here L layers. And, uh, and uh, the way it's being processed is using some parameters. So those are the parameters that have been trained in this, in this lab, right? And so when I've given the function, there's like some parameters that tell me how to go from one layer to the other by applying some parameterized function of x uh, k minus one to go to x k, okay? And so, Really, when I put all these parameters together, I want to think about this representation as a map that takes my input x0 and turns it into some xl. Are we all clear on what we're trying to do here? Right? So think about this as being a d-dimensional vector and this also be a d-dimensional vector. There's no labels anymore here because I'm only concerned about the, uh, the um, representation. So the way this, uh, this uh, uh, function is created is in a, in a compositional form. And so you take your... Uh, uh, value at the kth layer, then you add it to, to it, you add a, uh, you first take an, a fine transformation of this, uh, of this representation, then you take some nonlinearity entry-wise, so this is a vector entry-wise, for example, you just take the positive part of each entry of this vector, then you add your previous one and then you keep going to the next one and you do this again and again and again and those parameters W, K, B, K change at every layer. Okay, so that's your classical feedforward neural network or called also multilayer perceptron. And so this induces a map from X0 to XL, and that's what I will call a neural network. In fact, I'm going to make my life a little uh, maybe simpler in terms of notation. This is going, not going to have much of an impact, but I like this uh, perspective that says, think about this as a time discretization of a continuous time process where really XK plus one minus XK, I should view this as a direction of change, so I'm gonna call it XT dot, right? So T here is T is K. And then I'm just taking it to be sigma of wt x of t plus bt. 
So it's really as if I had a continuum of layers indexed by time, okay? And so this perspective has been exploited and you know, it, makes, it allows you to make a lot of connections to some dynamical systems and control and there's you know, a lot of very popular papers that have been exploiting this in the context maybe of the, the key word here would be neural ODEs. That's the way people take this, uh, this uh, continuous approach. Uh, uh, but this is not going to be very important. It's just going to be more convenient for me to just drag this like x dot of t rather than xk plus one minus xk, okay? So, I have some dynamics. Those are the dynamics that, you know, under which my input image evolves in the network. And I want to make sure that if you've heard dynamics related to neural networks, those are probably not the dynamics you've heard of. The ones that you've probably heard of are this training dynamics. And training dynamics are usually for when you have one hidden layer. Okay, so you just have one layer to learn your representation and then you do your machine learning thing. And, uh, and the names that are attached to this are, you know, May Montanari, Van den Eyden, Arthur Jaco, Shiza and Back, et cetera. And here, it's not dynamics on the x, it's dynamics on the thetas. Remember, the thetas were the parameters of the neural network, and those are the training dynamics when you're actually trying to minimize some loss uh, with respect to theta, and, uh, and you're applying gradient descent to do this, okay? So this is not what we're talking about. So if you've never heard of this, well, don't worry about it. If you've heard about this, please remember this is not what we're talking about. Those are not training dynamics. I'm actually thinking of an already trained neural network the thetas are given to me, okay? So, focusing on this xt dot is sigma of wt xt plus bt, I want to now think of a neural network as something that, you know, tells me how to go from x0 to xt, and that's called a flow map, right? Actually, uh, so I was teaching yesterday uh, at Optimal Transport, and we talked about flow maps there. And the flow map is really what you get when you integrate some ordinary differential equation, right? So you, you, I'm giving you the dynamics. You want to know where my ODE is going to be when I start at a given uh, initial, initial point, and I'm going to be somewhere here at time t. And so the way I want to think about a neural network is just a flow map, and then I have one, the same function that you apply to all the points one at a time. Okay, so just, it's just a function which is parameterized in an interesting way. And, you know, coming from statistics, for example, I think this is quite interesting. We have some functions that are from RD to RD, and if you ask me to come up with a class of functions from RD to RD, most likely what I would do is tensorize a notion from RD to R. For example, a reproducing kernel Hilbert space or a Sobolev uh, function or something like this. And I would just say, well, each of the coordinates of the output vector is something that's smooth, for example. Smoothness classes are the classical ones. And I think one of the, the main power of neural networks is that what they do is they parameterize those maps as flow maps. So that rather than parameterizing the map itself, they're like as if it was a table that says f of x is going there. It just says, I'm going to parameterize the curve that allows me to go from one to the other using those dynamics. Any question at this point? All right, so we're now in 2015. This thing I just described to you is the residual network. And, uh, but today we want to talk about transformers, okay? So transformers is really the bulk of what's made the news recently, and how are they different? So as I mentioned, it's probably easier here to switch from image to text because that's the more classical application that you've seen. You know, I'm sure everybody's on uh, uh, chat GPT improving their social skills. I mean, that's how I do it. I use it. And, uh, and so you're going to type a prompt in, uh, in, um, in uh, uh, chat GPT. So a prompt is just a sentence. What ChatGPT will do, your transformer will, it will first break it so that you actually get some input vectors, okay? So you break it into what's called tokens. So those tokens are kind of like a word or a piece of a word if the word is too big. And then to, uh, together with it, you're going to add an encoding which tells you where in the sentence the word showed up. For example, the word quick, you want to say was the second word in the sentence because maybe it has a different meaning depending on where it is in the sentence. So the naive way to do this would be to take your embedding of the word quick, so think about this as a vector in high dimension, and then you just slap on the number two at the back of it, okay? And that encodes the position. There's many complicated ways to do this, but this in principle is what they're doing. It's just telling you where it was in the original sentence, in the original prompt. Once I have everything together, so, and, and the encoding, I can learn it, or I can just take a random encoding, anything that takes a word and uh, uh, to a vector in a consistent fashion. So every time I see this word, I actually just map it to the same place with maybe the suffix that's different depending on where it is in the sentence. Then I get uh, just, a, just a dictionary. And now I have my tokens, which are, I will assume they're in RD, and this is basically those words with their position, okay? So this is my, set, my, my prompt, it was of length n, and so I have n vectors in RD. And just to give you an order of magnitude, I think these things are, of course, growing, so this is probably 
uh, uh, this is already dated, but uh, I mean, I heard you know, people are aiming for the billions, I think, for N at this point. Uh, but let's just think about this orders of magnitude where you know, N and D are kind of commensurate with N a bit larger than D. Of course, you could do this for images. I mentioned that transformers are not limited to, to text. In fact, you can do it for images. And how do you do it? Well, what you would do now is rather than taking your image as one long vector, you break it into patches. And then each patch will actually be sent to a particular uh, encoding vector. And then you just you know, record which position, for example, if you just do the lexicographic order of reading this image, you add which position in the image it was. And you can see this is a different way, rather than thinking about it as a long vector, you're actually kind of taking each patch as some, something that you like, and you're going to typically round it to a dictionary of patches, because there's just too many patches. And, uh, and then once you have each patch here, you're going to, um, you're going to um, uh, uh, just uh, uh, treat it. So you're going to have some information about which, wh who its neighbors are, and, uh, and you will keep it as the unit, rather than having the pixel as being the unit here. Okay? And that has actually been very successful in images. All right, so now let's forget about applications and think about what transformers are doing, okay? So what is the input of a transformer now, right? So the input was a prompt, but what is it mathematically? Well, since I actually, so I had x1 to xn, but since I actually know the positional encoding, I can actually forget about their order. So rather than having the sequence of x1, xn, I really have the set of x1, xn, right? So those are my tokens. They're in RD, and I don't care about their position. And so what I'm going to do is turn this set into an empirical measure, which is just the empirical measure of the position of the xi's. Okay, those are completely equivalent things. If you give me the left, I can build the right. If you give me the right, I can build the left. Okay? And so it's just a multi-set. And here, I, well, I should write it. This is a multi-set. And then I have uh, just the empirical measure. And so if I had multiple of them, I would have 2 over n uh, uh, here. Okay? This is not going to happen, obviously, because no two words are at the same position anyway. Okay, so the input to a transformer in my story will be a probability measure on token, which tells me just the empirical distribution of the prompt that I'm feeding it. Okay? Okay, what is the output? So a transformer is actually trained on trying to predict what the next token actually is. Right? So that's the, one of the, also the main engineering uh, uh, insights that they had. They said, okay, no one is going to tell me that this sentence means is a, something that's romantic or something that's beautiful or something that's aggressive. Right? So there's no labels of the text. And what label can you actually come up with? Well, the label, presumably, the next word that comes gives me some information about what preceded it. Okay? And so what you're going to use as a label for a sentence is the next token. And so you're going to try to do your classical machine learning that says, given a sentence, try to predict the next token. Okay, so what you're supposed to output is the next token here. But what is, how do I output the next token? Well, most likely I'm not going to be 100% sure of what the next token is. And so what I'm going to do is to give you a probability measure on tokens, which tells me the likelihood of what the next token should be. Okay, so my input is a probability measure on token, and my output is a probability measure on tokens. All right, so they have very different meanings, right? One is just the empirical distribution. The next one is just the likelihood of the next token. But what this enables me to do is just like in the case of ResNets, to model this map, which goes from probability measures on tokens to probability measures on token, as a flow map. I just have to move my probability distribution of tokens from one place to the other one. Okay, and so that's really where I'm, I'm, I can really use this idea of neural networks, which are very flexible modeling of images of, sorry, of functions from one set as, say, abstract space script X to the same abstract space script X, as long as I can move continuously in this space. So the way I want to think about transformers now are parameterized flow maps. So there's still going to be some parameters, right? Those are like, you know, the billions of parameters that, you know, OpenAI uh, trains with. And that maps now an initial distribution to a final distribution. So now P of RD is the space of probability distributions on RD. All right, so pictorially, I start with an image. Now, that's my prompt. That's the empirical distribution of the tokens, and I'm going to move the entire thing. And hopefully, it's going to be concentrated around, around what I think is the next token. Okay? So that's what my transformer is doing for me. And this perspective was already proposed in this paper on Syncformers in, in 2022, but, but maybe not emphasized as much, I guess. So... Okay, now I need to tell you what the dynamics of these measures are, right? I, used to, I told you what x dot was. There was like some nice uh, uh, formulation for this. So here I'm going to, I have to tell you what mu t dot is, okay? And if you don't want to be slapped in the face by a PD person, you cannot write mu t dot. You have to write dt mu t, but it's the same thing, okay? And so we write dt mu t. 
And, uh, and mu zero, I know, is my empirical distribution on tokens. So how do I move a distribution? Okay, so you're giving me tokens, and I would like to move their distribution. And if you think about the image I just showed you, the way I moved the distribution was by moving the positions of where the points were. And that's a way to move distributions. There's many ways to move distributions, but I could change the weights, but I can move the positions. And that's what transformers are actually doing. They're actually implementing a mean field interacting particle system. So here a particle is a token, and then token i has a velocity which is given by some vector field. So X, capital XT here is, uh, uh, denotes a vector field. It depends on where XT is, XI of, where this token is, XI of T, but it also depends on all of the other tokens, but not in any way. It only depends on all of the other tokens through their aggregate distribution. That's what mean field means. It sees all of the other tokens in the same way. It's not going to say, I'm moving only according, uh, I'm doing half a step in the direction of my nearest neighbor, and then uh, uh, you know, moving three steps away in the direction of my second nearest neighbor, and then token 25 is actually taking me there, right? You cannot just sort out tokens and treat them differently. Here, you only deal with them in an aggregate fashion. Okay, we'll see precisely how to do this, but that's at a high level, this is how it's actually done. So, now I told you how each token moves, you would like to know how the distribution moves, and that's a standard exercise, and you just plug this uh, um, velocity field in what's called the continuity equation, and it's going to tell you that dt mu t moves according to minus the divergence of mu t times this velocity field. Okay, so what are transformers doing? Well, they're just doing, picking a special choice for this thing, okay? So self, what I'm going to call self-attention dynamics, are a special choice of xt mu t. And the special choice is a bit of a mouthful, so we're going to spend a second parsing it together. Okay, so there's three parameters, right? Remember, this is a parameterized flow map, so there's parameters that I've been trained in the OpenAI lab, and so those parameters at each layer, you know, time t, are three matrices, vt, which is called the value matrix, qt, which is the query matrix, and kt, which is called the key matrix, okay? The, the way you actually uh, uh, use those things is as follows, all right? So rather than going uh, parsing these integrals here, I'm go I want you to take a look at this right-hand side here. What this is doing, it says, in fact, the, the direction of a token is something that looks like the average of the other tokens with respect to a distribution, which is a tilted version of the distribution of the other tokens. I'll mention in a second what this distribution is. And then I have like a preconditioner to it, VT, because, I mean, why not, right? You can always learn some preconditioner on your dynamics, so you just do it. So VT, I'm not going to have much to say about it. Maybe just think about it as being the identity, and in fact, it will be the identity in the, in the rest of the talk, okay? But it's just some preconditioner that you learn. Now, what is this tilted measure? I think this is really what's important. So you would like, so if this was not tilted, that would just be the average of all of the other tokens, right? It would say, just move in the direction of the, uh, the direction in which you move is the average of all of the other tokens. But here what you do is you don't weight all of the other tokens in the same way. You see, so this is the average of Y, but the way I actually reweight my distribution of all other tokens is by essentially putting less weight on the tokens that are far away from me, right, for which this inner product is actually small, and the geometry in which I measure proximity is governed by this QT, KT, right? Which is really just QT transpose KT is the only thing that matters here, right? And so basically what I'm saying is I'm moving in the direction of the weighted average of the tokens where I put more weight on tokens that are close to me in a sense that where, the, where proximity is measured according to this KT, QT, okay? So that's the way you do this. And, uh, and uh, uh, once you... Um, once you, so I wrote it as integrals because it's just convenient for me, but if you start from mu t, which is just a empirical measure, right? When you have n tokens and you move them deterministically, they will stay n tokens. And then in that case, all these integrals are really sum. And what you can see is that token i, so if we forget about vt here, is moving according to this. So this is just a, for each i, the p ij's, the collection of pij's, a row of a matrix, and this matrix is stochastic. So those are non-negative and sum to one. So it's just really a weighted average of each of the j's, but the weights change from token to token based on who your neighbors are in this geometry. Okay, so that's in a nutshell what the self, so this is the self-attention layer, the big thing that was this big step in transformers. And uh, uh, so here, 
obviously there's other things that show up, right? In the diagram that I showed you at the beginning, there's like multiple things that you do as usual in neural networks, so I will mention them. So one of them that's quite important is something called layer norm. So layer norm is something that says, well, when I have this dynamics, I actually, so they will tend to explode to infinity. And so rather than letting them explode to infinity, every time I move my tokens, I'm going to project them back on the sphere. This is called layer normalization. And in a continuous time, it's the same as saying that I, whatever velocity field comes out of this self-attention layer, I'm going to project on the tangent space of the sphere, which forces me to have all of my particles stay on the sphere. Okay, I'm not allowed to move in any normal direction. So now I have dynamics evolving on the sphere. And uh, in practice, there's also a couple more things that are quite important, but you know, adding complexity, so we're going to not talk about them. One is that there's a multi-layer perceptron. Okay, so after doing this self-attention, typically you intersperse this with, with some multi-layer perceptrons, like the usual ResNets that we've done before, because, well, why not? If you can put more parameters, you can always do this. And uh, another thing that people do is that they um, run a bunch of those things in parallel, and then they average them together. So those are called heads when you run k of them in parallel. Let's say you run 20 of them uh, in parallel, and then you just average them after each uh, uh, layer. So you first do your attention layer, then you do your MLP layer, then you uh, do your uh, uh, normalization layer. Actually, this probably should be on the other side. So you do your normalization layer, and then you average everything you see, and then you keep going, okay? So here, again, the projection should probably be on the other side because I want to stay on the sphere, sorry about that. So we're not going to mention those two things because I'm trying to extract something essential about self-attention and, and, uh, and there's just too much going on here. So the question I'm going to be asking is the following. So now I have some dynamics which only contain this novel mechanism which is called attention and I want to understand where does this thing go, right? So we think about it as something you take an initial prompt and you're gonna send it to a final likelihood. And as the title indicate, I want to, so of course, each prompt, initial prompt is gonna send me to a different mu t, right? The, the large asymptotic thing will be different. Obviously, it's a function, it's not going to send everybody to the same place. But I want to see if there's like a characteristic of all of the limiting distributions that I get on the other side. And what we're going to show is that they tend to be clustered distributions, okay? So, before I go in some theoretical nonsense, let me just see if this actually makes sense in practice. So here we downloaded something called Albert, which is a light bird. So it's a bird with weight sharing, uh, which you can get on the hugging face. And, uh, and uh, what we're plotting here is the histogram of the inner products between tokens uh, after each layer. Okay, or actually after a certain number of layers, I don't want to do this for, all right, so this is at layer zero. This is the embedding of a particular sentence from Wikipedia, and you see the distribution of the inner product. So here, it's not very symmetric. There's like some train embedding going on here a little bit. And now I want to see how it changes as I move along the layers. All right, so as you can see, it starts shifting to the right, right, meaning that all of those guys are probably getting closer somehow. Shifting to the right, and you can see developing this point mass at one. And what does it mean for two tokens to have inner product one on the sphere? It means that they're in the same position. Okay, so as I keep going, those guys start having like a spike, uh, and that means that I actually have some clusters. Okay, so this is the the the, the final thing. And so here, uh, uh, you can actually count the number of uh, of peaks here, and it looks like it's you know three choose two, in fact, so that means that essentially there should be something like three clusters, right? Three pairwise distances, but there could be more in case there's like, you know, same pairwise distances. This is actually an interesting question really to this partial digest problem or, or, or turnpike problem that I learned from Michel, the terminology which consists in recovering um, uh, elements from their pairwise distances. It's typically studied on integers, but you know, we could do this on the sphere in high dimensions and ask for this kind of questions as well. Anyway, this is uh, completely tangential. But as you can see, starting from the initial distribution to the final distribution, we clearly move from an unclustered uh, uh, configuration to a clustered configuration. And our goal here will be to explain what happened here. So transformers are complicated machines, right? Remember, there's like all these things that are going on. There's train parameters. There's uh, attention layers. There's uh, multi-layer perception. There's uh, normalization layer. I mean, there's like old, uh, there's multi-heads. There's lots of things that are going on. It's a very complicated object. And my goal here will be to, you know, extract a model that somehow gives me enough information to be able to recover this particular uh, property. Okay. 
So this is just a picture, but really the right analogy you want to think of probably is this, uh, uh, you know, perfect gas, where you know, like the Boltzmann idea is to say you start with some complicated gas with like some complicated molecules colliding in some different ways, and then you just say, okay, those are just uh, um, hard sphere models that just collide in a certain way, and uh, and then you want to recover maybe the second law of thermodynamics or something like this out of it. Okay, so just some microscopic feature. So we're going to just simplify our model significantly. So first of all, we only look at uh, attention and the layer norm. So before, in our first attempt, we did not study layer norm. We did see some clustering, but since things were going to infinity, it was really far from what was happening. And in fact, the dynamics are much more interesting on the sphere. So we'll keep the layer norm. And, uh, and, uh, but this is pretty complicated, right? I mean, there's KT, QT that change at every time. Uh, there's VT over there. Those are very complicated things. Like, what should I pick? Well, we're going to make our life very easy. We're going to take essentially all of them to be equal to the identity, okay? So VT will be the identity, and QT, KT will be a parameter beta. I still want to have some tuning knob here, uh, some temperature parameter beta times the identity, which basically terms my dynamics as follows, okay? So it's just still this weighted average of the tokens, but the weights are just this, like, exponentially downweighted things according to their inner product in the classical geometry. Okay, and just the uh, Euclidean geometry. Okay, everybody uh, has time to ingest this thing, so that's the dynamics we're going to be studying. Okay, so you take a weighted average of your neighbors according to how close you are. Beta basically is the scale parameter that tells you how far you want to actually consider someone a neighbor, right? So it's just giving you some range here. And then we project on the sphere so that we stay on the sphere. And so it turns out that if you look at this thing, you can actually, okay, so I'm going to go a little fast, but uh, in some sense, I will say, it is a gradient flow of some repulsive energy on the sphere, okay? So this is the energy that we're looking at. So it's this Gaussian style thing where you're basically looking at e to the minus square distances. And if you were to actually minimize this, so this, this is an energy that you find in this paper by Henry Cohn and Kumar, uh, uh, which is actually an energy when you minimize it, you get some optimal configurations. Okay, and there's, this is a very complicated landscape. You get different optimal configurations depending on the number of points, uh, on the dimension in which you live. But we're not minimizing this energy. So if you look, this is actually not a gra the, gra the negative gradient of something. It is the gradient of something. So we're not doing gradient descent. We're doing gradient ascent. So I'm going to call this a reverse gradient flow, right? just like we talk about reverse heat flow. And in that case, it's very easy to convince ourselves that the global maximizers are just when all the points are in the same place, right? I'm trying to maximize this thing. This is positive, so I want to minimize what's in there. So the way I minimize it is by making all of these exponents equal to zero, and the way I make all these exponents equal to zero is by putting all the points in the same location. Okay, so those are the global maximizers. They're all like a single cluster, okay? So if my dynamics, which are trying to maximize this thing, go to the global maximum, I'm going to have not even a cluster, generally clustered, I'm going to have a single cluster at the end. And so the question that comes here is, does gradient flow get trapped in local maxima? So the answer is, uh, 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 so we have a very partial answer, so you know, if you're interested in solving some technical questions, uh, what we can prove is the following. So if beta is larger than n squared, where n is the number of particles that we had, so very uh, low temperature, so and or beta is less than one over n, so very high temperature. So what does it mean? When beta is uh, uh, very low, it means that I'm essentially moving only according to my nearest neighbor. And when beta is very small, I'm essentially moving according to the average of everyone without really doing any weighting. Okay, so, you know, the fact that we can prove something is already, we're happy with it, but if you take n go to infinity, you can see that those completely vacuous, right? There's no, those things just disappear. And we actually think it's going to be true for all beta, that all of those particles will actually collide to one single point no matter what beta you run, but it's going to take a very long time to actually get there. Okay? So that's great, but in practice, if you think about the example I gave you for Albert, it was not just like a single cluster, right? There was a bunch of clustered points, but we said that there was potentially three clusters, maybe more if there were like some, you know, same distances between those clusters. And so it turns out that if we run even our simple dynamics on the sphere, what we really see is this for like a reasonable choice of beta. All right, so if beta is very small or very large, it will go to one single cluster, just like we can prove it. But in, in this case, we actually end up in this thing. But if you actually stare at this for a little longer, you can see that points are still moving, albeit very slowly. 
And we're in actually in a metastable state. We're in a saddle point of this uh, energy functional where we're trying to find what is the direction and we're just basically very slowly moving. The gradient is super small, and, but we're still moving. And if we had the patience, this thing, we would wait and they would start like two clusters would collide into one more. Uh, so three clusters would, would collapse into two clusters. And then in another time scale, two clusters would collapse in, a, in one cluster. So those things, so the metastable states obviously is what matters in practice, right? I mean, we don't have an infinite number of layers. We have a finite number of layers. And this is really what matters. And so right now, we have very little tools to understand how to study metastable states for deterministic uh, dynamical systems. I know how to study metastable state for random systems, right? Because you have you know, the brown motion that excites the particles, and you know, there's some escape time, which you know, at some point I'm going to get enough deviations from my random noise that I'm going to get out of a local minimum. But here, I don't have a local minimum. I actually just want to escape this. And so the only thing we know is there's this uh, study of a, a, a PD called um, Allen can or cannular, uh, uh, where similar phenomena arise, where there's some metastable states that are in a completely deterministic evolution, but we don't know how to apply them right now. But we're working on this, and, and we can show that some states are metastables, but we cannot show that we're going to end up in a metastable state no matter where we start from. Now, another question you might ask is, how many clusters, right? So there's only one parameter here which is beta. And I said that if I take beta very small or very large, I'm going to have essentially just one cluster. And so it turns out that we can prove, or we can prove, we can get some insight about how beta governs the number of clusters we're actually getting. And it should be of order square root of beta. And you can convince yourself that this is what's going to happen. It's because one over square root of beta, think about everything being on the circle, one over square root of beta is the range at which you're looking at your neighbors, right? So basically you're covering, so then they act as groups, of size one over square root of beta, since the circle is you know, of constant length, you're gonna have square root beta of them. And so basically that's how you actually get your, your states. To do this, we actually study, so that was actually the statistical part. I don't have much time for this, but uh, we study the number of modes of a kernel density estimator using Katz Rice formulas and, and Edwards extensions. All right, so the question I always get when I give this presentation is, wait, what happened to your data? Like, did you just tell me, so there was just this one beta and everybody's going to a clustered state, like, what am I doing? So there's two things that are happening. The first one is, there's two types of data. There's the input data, which is by prompt, and the training data. Let's start with the input data. So you gave me a prompt, and this prompt was sent to a clustered state, okay? And I have this map, which is only parameterized by beta, but in general, it's parameterized by all these KQVs, right? And, uh, and if I give it another prompt, I'm going to get another clustered state, okay? And so I have a map that goes from uh, uh, different initial distributions to different final distributions. So definitely here, I did not lose track of my data, so I'm not claiming that this map is injective or anything, but there's definitely a map that does different things for different inputs. And of course, where is my training data? Well, in practice, my training data is in the parameters of this map here. And what we did is we said, well, the behavior of this map, so this map is sending everyone to the set of clustered distributions. Within this set, it certainly makes the difference between what input data we get. And so we found a simpler map that does the same thing and has a similar form. So one thing you might ask is, okay, how does this go from, so we can prove that this thing goes to a clustered state, right? And, and the question is, what does it do? Like, what is the most likely outcome now, right? Let's just zoom in a little deeper and say, okay, if I have two different input distributions, somehow can I say something about how their final distribution will differ? And so what we can show is that this thing is not quite a gradient flow of the negative entropy, but it's actually decreasing entropy at a linear rate, okay? Which means that if you take the negative entropy, it grows linearly. So what did this thing do? It's basically sucking out the entropy of your initial distribution. So of course here I need a distribution mu, which is uh, has a density, so I can define this quantity. But if I start, I can always define those dynamics on, in, on continuous distribution. And what it does is basically sucking out the entropy out of a distribution, okay? So you have this thing that's smooth and it's just like keeping out only some clusters. So it is very much, and that would what a reverse heat flow would do for us, right? Those are very unstable, but you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to suck out the entropy. Okay, so I'm going to conclude. So my main message here is that transformers cluster tokens. All right, and I hope I'm gonna have a question about neural collapse uh, uh, to tell you how this is not quite neural collapse. Uh, that I think the metastable states, so here we spent, most of our math is about proving that we go to a single cluster asymptotically, 
but it's going to take an exponential time to get there. So those metastable states that we get stuck in for a long time along the way are very important. We need to study them. And uh, uh, I would like a better understanding of this compression scheme, right? I mean, showing that the entropy grows, I would like to know if there's a better notion of entropy that this thing is actually trying to maximize, maybe get some, some stability, right? Something that would tell me, well, this is actually compressing somehow your uh, input prompt, and I would want to, want to understand. And of course, then there's like, you know, stepping stones all the way to the full transformer by starting maybe adding multiple uh, uh, KQs and Vs. So for example, we've run some experiments that show that if KQ and V are chosen random, uh, then we have similar phenomena that arise. Of course, they're, I'd say, macroscopically, quantita sorry, qualitatively. What is the effect of the MLP layer? And then in practice, people don't actually look at all of the tokens. Each token is not looking only at all of the tokens, but only usually at the previous tokens. All right, so those are called decoder transformers. This is what ChatGPT is doing, and those are called mask attention. You're only looking at a subset of the other tokens, and we're looking at this as well. Uh, understanding the effect of heads is also something we have not touched upon. So I think it's a very exciting time to look at, uh, at transformers. And, uh, and uh, with these questions, uh, I think I'm going to conclude. Thank you for your attention. like you're talking about glasses. In material science, this kind of uh, approach to, to a subspace rather than approach to an answer or a highly symmetric solution is what people in who worry about glass have been... Exactly. So this... Uh, as, this as a shortcut for their endpoint. Yeah, so Alan Kahn is, is, is studying this kind of, of, uh, of media. Uh, right, so it's just showing how things like collapse to like some clustered states and then start going together. So there's like, uh, so I'm mostly interested in the mathematical aspect, but absolutely, the, those PDEs that are uh, um, that I mentioned are studied exactly in the in the context of classes, and uh, and there is some tools. So Felix Soto and, and Maria Resnikov have a paper where they introduce something called the slow manifold hypothesis, where they're kind of studying what's happening, and they're essentially showing that you collapse to a small to a manifold on which you move very slowly, and from this manifold you start collapsing to another one and so there's yeah there is some tools that just don't apply directly here but yeah it is it is uh, it is uh, but uh, maybe at the physical level there's there are more tools but at the mathematical level they're not quite uh, as developed as I would like them to be yeah. that was my feeling in terms of, of the physical understanding with glasses there is an organized state somewhere beyond where the glass ever reaches okay Absolutely, and, and that's, where, that's what's happening for transformers, right? The, the single cluster is this organized state that we actually never see in practice with a finite number of layers. And even if we had a continuum of layers, I think what we, so here, there's two things, right? When you take your layers to a continuum, you don't have to take the time horizon to be infinite. You could have a continuum of layers to go from time zero to time one. And uh, it seems that what transformers do in practice is that they say, okay, let's start Let's decide when things start to crystallize a little bit. Put the horizon there, and then however many layers you give me, I'm going to use to discretize time as finely as I can up until this time. But no one ever, like those things never go to infinity. And the way I actually make this go to a single cluster uh, with this, sorry, with this uh, collab thing is by actually taking one transformer that was trained and then stacking it on top of itself. So actually I, I showed like 40 plus layers there, but the transformer we're using only has I don't know, 15 layers, and so we just stack them on top of each other so we could actually just artificially increase the number of layers of this transformer. Can you break problems apart and, and look at the pieces that are converging to parts of the solution and then come back from that? Yeah, so we don't know how to do this at all. Uh, um, I mean, that's a good question, we just don't know how to do this. So maybe let's take the rest of the questions offline. So we've got a break until 10.30 where we'll, uh, we'll resume with the lightning talks and then we'll have the next plenary talk by Sendo. So let's thank Philippe again.